Hello class, uh, welcome to the fifth, uh, fifth session of our lecture on human geography. For today, we are going to look at agriculture and human geography. And this is a two-part lecture. Um, the purpose of this uh, lecture is to introduce you to agricultural systems in order to understand the role of agriculture in national development. In any country, agriculture plays uh, an important role, and uh, it's important for you to have a feel or understanding of uh, this in this lecture. Um, so the objective, as you see uh, on the slide, is to explain the role of agriculture in national development, describe the different approaches to classifying world agricultural systems, and uh, to describe the key characteristics and dynamics of agricultural systems in the world. Uh, so you get a, a better understanding of these uh, things as we get along. Um, just like I've read to you earlier on, the session, the outline of this uh, session will take this uh, format. Um, we'll look first at the role of agriculture in national development, the classification of world agricultural systems the agricultural systems in the tropical regions, and then the summary. And the usual readings, uh, um, I encourage you to read uh, chapter 11, pages 39, uh, sorry, 349 to 381 of uh, this particular textbook, which you are very familiar with. That, that's uh, Fuberg, Murphy, and Dibley human geography, people, place, and culture. Yeah, so to begin with, we will look at the role of agriculture in uh, nat uh, national development. Um, agriculture plays, uh, as I said earlier on, plays a major role in any uh, country's development. And it involves the cultivation, production of uh, crops or livestock. Um, and I think you're very familiar with that in your country or in any community that uh, you belong to, that usually people who are engaged in agriculture are either uh, producing crops or are engaged in uh, livestock production. Uh, and then it's normally uh, synonymous to farming. So usually when you find people in that sector, they call them farmers. But um, in some settings, you would only uh, think about people who are engaged in crop production as only farmers, but then those in livestock production, such as uh, cattle production or sheep pro uh, production or even piggery, are all classified as farmers. And it's uh, basically an economic activity. And why is it so? Because people depend on that uh, for their livelihoods. So that's why it is an economic activity. But in this lecture, you also get to know that people engage in this farming practice basically to feed themselves. So it's a kind of a subsistence uh, form of uh, activity. But uh, looking at agriculture broadly, it is an economic activity. And that's what our focus is on. Um, in terms of its role, it serves as source of food. I don't know if anybody uh, here doesn't eat. Everybody eats, so basically it's a source of food for our survival. Uh, it's a source of raw material for manufacturing. Any, uh, most uh, businesses are agro-based and they need uh, resources or raw materials from the farms. Uh, you can take um, a shoe factory, for instance, and uh, you think about the leather. Basically, the leather has come from, uh, let's say, a, a cattle ranch where uh, the skin of the uh, cattle has been removed. You know, for other, uh, let's say, another example could be uh, an orange juice uh, factory. You know, the farm, the, an orange farm will supply oranges to this uh, industry, which will be extracted, the orange will be extracted to make the juice. So it serves as a source of raw material for uh, the industry. Um, it's also a major uh, source of employment. In many countries, uh, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, agriculture actually um, employs a lot of uh, people 
in that sector. So, you know, uh, it, it puts uh, food on the table for many people in terms of making money, you know, to buy food and to um, uh, meet other ends meet. Um, it's also a major source of foreign exchange because um, when these farmers produce their goods, uh, they, many of them tend to supply them or sell them abroad. And as a result of that, the country is able to earn uh, foreign exchange, which it would use to uh, purchase other things or finance uh, development in the country. Um, in the attempt to understand the role of agriculture in terms of uh, national development, it's also important for us to understand certain theories. You know, there are theories that, you know, broadens or gives us a better understanding of the role of agriculture in any uh, country's development. And um, we have uh, ideas coming from Arthur Lewis, um, in 1954 and then Rostow in 1960. Um, for those of you who do not know Arthur Lewis and Rostow, I will encourage you to read about them. I, I, we don't have the time to go into the personalities of uh, uh, these people, but then I'll encourage you to read um, on them. Um, the things that they talk about, first, um, they say agriculture was characterized by extensive under employment and very uh, low labor productivity. You know, what this means is that agriculture is a very broad area, you know, and it has a lot of derivatives. So it means that it's a place that they see uh, as underexplored because there's so much job that people can actually get from agriculture. So that's why they say it is extensively under employment. Right, because it can basically employ a lot of people. And in the same way, it means that the productivity within that field is also low because there's so much work to be done. Imagine you have maize. Uh, you go into maize production. You know, the maize can be turned into different food, I mean, processed into different kinds of food. But beside that, you know, you have people who pro uh, perhaps provide machinery. So that's another job. In the same vein, somebody will be supplying um, uh, packaging materials, you know. So that's another form of job creation, extension offices. So there is so much to do when, I mean, when it comes to agriculture. So that's one thing that they say. Beside that, it also transfers labor force into the industry without bringing a decline to the sector. And what does, uh, this means is that when you transfer a lot of labor, for example, from agriculture into the industry, the labor is still not going to affect uh, the agriculture industry because there's so much to be done. But basically, the core thing here is that there is a relationship between agriculture and industry in that agriculture pro uh, supplies industry with a lot of labor. And then, um, the transfer of labor into the industry also becomes uh, uh, results in economic growth, right? Because if everybody's working, for example, the productivity would uh, go up, the country can sell a lot, make a lot of money, and that can affect economic growth. And those who are in that field, when they have money, they can also uh, purchase a lot of things. And any economic growth is all about demand. You know, when people demand so many things, then, you know, they spend. And as they spend, the country gets a lot of money, right? Uh, the other thing is that the, the, the main function of agriculture is to supply industry and other sectors of the economy with labor force, right? So it's not only about the agro-based industry, but there are other industries which agriculture can also depend on, right? I mean, imagine you have, let's say, Daco Farms that produces um, uh, beds, right? They, they can hire uh, lawyers, you know, 
to defend them when they run into trouble or uh, to help them develop their business plans or in to go into certain contracts. So in that sense, they are kind of creating jobs in the service industry, you know, um, getting the services of lawyers, for example. So it means that they supply labor not only in one field, but uh, agriculture related field, but you know, other uh, distant fields. And it uh, it's also uh, develops the economy or helps the economy to move up. So basically, agriculture, agriculture can be seen as a nation builder. Um, another theory, uh, it's coming from uh, Simon Kuznets, uh, which also uh, came out in 1966. And here he identified three forms of contributions to agriculture to aggregate growth. And here, if we're talking about aggregate growth, it's a total growth, you know. And for him, he sees uh, the, ma the market as a, a great contributor to agriculture. And in the sense that agriculture purchases product from other sectors at home and abroad and also sells um, products to other sectors. You know, so what this thing means is that, uh, for example, the um, f a farm may buy seeds, for example, which um, he will get them locally, but then when they produce, they would send them abroad, right? And then um, they would also sell these products to other sectors, just like we've uh, talked about. You know, there are. Uh, uh, recently that we've seen uh, biofuels where people in the oil industry are um, producing oil from um, um, agrarian products, you know. I mean, they can sell these uh, things to them. Others are also using uh, the waste from animal production into energy production, the, uh, bio uh, the, the biogas, for example. Right, so they could decide to sell to others in a different industry altogether because you know that uh, energy generation and agriculture are basically uh, different industries altogether. So they're able to do that. And it's also a factor contribution in the sense that they transfer resources from agriculture to other sectors, you know. And the same thing can be read into uh, the oil production because the waste that is generated uh, from um, uh, let's say pig production you know become a resource for oil production right so it depends on how these things are classified right and uh, the production contribution uh, arises from growth within the agriculture itself uh, sector itself and um, all these theories show evidence that there's a close relationship between agriculture uh, growth in industry and agriculture they, they move hand in hand so um, in the 1960s, what these theories actually meant was that um, for the development of any country to take place, there has to be a very strong agricultural base, which will supply raw materials to the industry. And with that, the country will be able to earn a lot of uh, money, which will be used in the development of the country. Right, so it is a very important thing. And looking at this uh, within the context of Africa, I think it's very important. Most African governments are talking about industrialization. Of course, the service sector is doing well, but then um, with industrialization, you need to get a very strong resource base, and agriculture can serve that purpose. Right, so although these uh, theories have come in the 1960s, they still have relevance for today. Um, another um, aspect of agriculture, the role of agriculture to economic development of a country is that, um, and looking at this specifically within the context of Ghana, um, about 57% of total land of this country are into agriculture. Um, but this is mainly in the rural areas because most rural areas depend on agriculture for their survival. Right, but in the urban centers, you can see that there's so much urbanization going on. So most of the lands which were designated for agricultural purposes are now being used for something else. Some of them have become residential uh, 
uh, residence for people at the same time they've also been used for uh, industries I mean today I hear that um, a lot of businesses have taken over houses which were built in uh, the East Legon, which is supposed to be a purely residential area. So there's that competition between businesses and uh, people's uh, residences where businesses are taking over. I mean, it's an urban phenomenon. Um, Beside that, the agriculture employs the highest proportion of the economically active people. And this is also uh, in relation to the rural areas. So when you look at the rural area, for instance, um, according to the 2010 population housing census, about 56, oh, sorry, 58.6% of female uh, headed um, people are employed in agriculture and 73.1 uh, male headed in households are employed in agriculture. So it tells you that over 50%, more than half of the population in the rural uh, areas are engaged in some farming activity. And beside that, agriculture also contributes uh, significantly to our gross domestic product. but. Uh, it, it, it's something that uh, cannot be compared to other sectors, though, like uh, the services, because over the years it's been declining, right? From 2009 up to uh, 2014, it had declined um, quite uh, significantly. But all the same, you know, it makes a major contribution to our gross domestic product. It also contributes uh, to uh, the government's revenue collection our earnings. Um, it serves as a main source of um, food to the growing population in our uh, country. And beside that, it also serves as a source of raw materials to even non-agriculture uh, uh, businesses or industry. And it supplies raw materials to other uh, agro-based industries. Um, take Unilever, for instance. Unilever has a wide range of products. But many of them are getting their raw materials from agriculture. You, the ideal milks, the carnation milks that they produce, they get their raw materials, uh, the milk, you know, from the farms. Uh, the soap that they produce, they get, uh, most of them are produced from palm oil. So it is the farm, palm oil industry that supplies them with this um, uh, raw material. So it goes on and on. I, I was on a tour uh, somewhere in the UK and I also learned that um, the soap uh, industry actually goes around the city of London collecting uh, the, uh, the waste from butcheries on a daily basis and then they use the um, waste to produce the liquid soap. So most if you are consuming or using liquid soap every day, some of them are actually products from the butchery shop. They cut them and the meat is processed, you know, and extract the potassium and other things from it, which is used in producing um, uh, liquid soap. So if you have used liquid soap before, then it means that <laughs> it's a byproduct of <laughs> some of these things. Um, and of course, uh, all these things are sold on a local and international market uh, and that the government gets revenue from it locally and also foreign exchange. So having um, listened to the lecture so far, I would want to ask this question. Why is agriculture a key sector to the development of your country? And I'm asking this because I know many of you are coming from different countries. We have Ghanaians here, we have people from the West African sub-region and even abroad. So I just want you to reflect and see how agriculture uh, contributes to your national economy. Yeah, so having finished with this, I would move on to the classification of uh, world agriculture system uh, or systems. You know, you should bear in mind that uh, when it comes to the classifications of uh, agriculture, there are various uh, systems uh, available. But usually uh, it is based on the culture. And why is, or why are we talking about culture here? 
Ideally, one will see culture as a way of life of the people. But then we would see that culture actually shapes people's lives, their thinking. Now, what is uh, these things? Um, how do this uh, culture actually emerge? First of all, we can see that the environmental conditions of a country play a major role, right? So, for, for example, um, in the advanced country, they have a more uh, mechanized way of farming, you know. Uh, so you can see that uh, it's the environment that they have which has um, kind of encouraged them to go into this kind of culture, right? It could also be about technology. They are highly technological, so when you go to their farms, it's more mechanized, right? So the technology tends to shape the agricultural environment, and by the use of technology, one could say that it's all about culture, right? And uh, the human adaptation to the environment and human organization of space. To talk about human adaptation to the environment, you know, the environment, for example, in that part of the world is cold, right? And they need to farm. So they have to find ways to adapt in order to produce. So sometimes when it's winter, you still find them producing. You know, they develop new ways in which they can still uh, produce on the market. And then when it comes to the organization of space or land in specific areas, um, some of in some instances they will have greenhouse. So during winter they are still uh, producing, you know, so they will demarcate areas, they organize their farming areas in a particular way, you know. If it's also during the season where it's not so snowing, they operate in the open space and they design the landfill in a way, right? So they have a very organized way of um, um, organizing their space. So when we talk about the classification, it involves the subdivisions of area or objects according to the distinguishing characteristics, right? And you uh, understand this as we get along. Um, the system, the agricultural system actually refers to putting different farming systems into classes. And what are these classes? You would also understand. A class must be well and clearly defined because if you're going to talk about classes, then you, you, you need to you know, make it very clear because without that definition, one would find it very difficult to understand, wouldn't know the links or you kind of blur the different uh, classes available. And the classes may be subdivided based on the set of principles. So, um, there are a number of um, theories which have been uh, propounded or ideas which have been put in place to help us to understand the classifications of uh, agricultural systems. Um, but the key thing, as I said earlier on, that there's no general uh, classification you know, or generic um, agricultural system. And according to which will say in 1936, that's also one classic example, is that the world agricultural system can be based on five criteria. So when you want to classify agricultural system, you have to look at the, uh, this criteria. And one is that crops and livestock uh, combinations. You see how um, certain farms are able to combine livestock and crops. So you can go to a farm where somebody is mixing the two. So that can be seen as one form of uh, farming system. Right? It could also be in terms of the methods employed. Because when you go to the different parts of the world, because of the adaptations that we've talked about, or the culture, they might have different methods. Like in the developed world where they use the me mechanized, you, find, you go to farms and they have combined harvesters. Um, you go to the developing world, it's a different story uh, altogether. People are doing things manually or using very rudimentary tools, right? So it tells you that the methods of agriculture uh, production is, are different, you know. So in terms of the classification, if you want to classify a particular farming system, then it should be based on the kind of methods, right? So if you say, no, mechanized farming, for example, it's a form of classification, right? 
and then the intensity and use of labor and capital certain uh, agricultural production involves a lot of labor in other sense to or in other settings it is more about capital and we can still use the developing and uh, developed uh, countries uh, examples you know in most uh, developed countries I with my visits to uh, farms I realized that some farms are so huge but the labor there is small sometimes it's just the farmer himself one man you know uh, cultivating over 10 hectares right but then if you go elsewhere there are about 50 people working on that same uh, field uh, in terms of size and the methods of disposal of farm products you know there are different ways of uh, disposal of uh, farm products elsewhere it's also it becomes a source of raw material they use the the, the, the hay for example to feed the cows and the horses when you go to other jurisdictions they burn them right so they have different ways others to recycle them it, it will be used as a form of raw material for some other products and the kinds of buildings and structures necessary to carry the agricultural activities is also another way of uh, or criteria in which one can use to uh, classify an agricultural system so all of these actually produces 13 divisions of world farming and i will encourage you to read this article and then you would see the 13 divisions that, that uh, is associated with it yeah another criteria is also coming from car 1990 and it provides a newer classification based on the demand uh the demand of output for of farming you know when one produces people will definitely demand them and then there are certain things that are associated with them the other is on human input factors and here uh the key things is that people uh, engage in an intensive or extensive form of farming so you see the uh, the details uh, late in the later slides and then the other one is the fiscal inputs you know this basically um, how the fiscal inputs um, you know affects or contributes to agricultural production so here we can look at the climate climate is a major player when it comes to agricultural production the soil it's also another uh, major player and then the vegetation within that area so when we talk about the types of demand we can look at it from subsistence and then commercial and the general understanding of subsistence farming is that people consume what they eat largely uh, because they wouldn't have surplus even if even if they had surplus it would be sold locally but that is very small and then people go into commercial uh, farming and that one is that they produce these uh, products and then sell them on the market so you can have examples such as cash crop production others could be uh, and when we talk about cash crop production it could be cocoa in this country we produce a lot of cocoa we are number two uh, in the world ranking of cocoa producers right and so there's a basically you see that uh, when it comes to the output demand it is based on or classified in terms of subsistence and commercial uh, agricultural systems now with the human input factors it is based on labor the how labor actually produces uh, or comes out with this agricultural products and here the farming system can be divided into intensive and exten uh, extensive farming right and intensive farming is the ratio of labor capital and other outputs uh, inputs uh, which are available in the area so the combination of these resources uh, gives you that uh, output and then when it comes to extensive farming this occurs when the land is uh, sufficiently plentiful so you have a very large area which you go into very uh, extensive farming right 
and then the producer is only concerned about his overall returns because it's a business venture because um, if you look at the opposite which is the subsistence the person would only produce a little for himself but this one you're looking at a, a very large market right and in countries which have larger populations talk about the indians talk about the chinas the united states if they are going into this kind of agriculture system then it means that they actually have to produce a lot to feed the uh, the number of people over there and it's uh, not uh, primarily concerned with the yield per unit area right so it means that they actually go into this uh, big time production and you can see from um, this uh, figure here, in terms of uh, intensive farming uh, system, you can see the substance farming in Southeast Asia, right? They have a very large population, but then um, many of the people there too are poor, right? So they would produce rice to feed themselves, their families. And then when it comes to commercial farming, it's about market gardening right and in terms of the extensive they have the shifting cultivation system or bush uh, following system which is much more uh, predominant in africa but then in terms of uh, the commercial farming it is more of an extensive grain uh, production for example in usa and sheep ranching in australia the same can be said uh, of New Zealand, they produce a lot of sheep, right, in, in a very large scale, you know, for commercial purposes. So you can see the, the difference from the, uh, the figure over there, our table. Yeah, in terms of the fiscal inputs, we have climate influence. You know, it can limit agricultural production. In recent times, we're talking about climate change. Um, the times where people know to be rainy seasons are actually changing. And this, uh, when that uh, happens, it affects uh, production because it is raining at the wrong time and people cannot actually adjust to these changes. So climate is a very um, important thing. And as a result of the climate that certain, uh, of certain places actually, they can't grow certain food crops go to the temperate regions and I, I doubt you find an acre of cocoa farm there because the climate there uh, does not provide a condition for uh, cocoa trees to grow, right? And the climatic maps correspond with different types of agriculture, you know, and the same thing can be linked with the cocoa production. So sometimes you find certain uh, products being labeled as tropical uh, crops you know, because they grow mainly in the tropics. And the climate elements uh, such as uh, solar energy, for instance, may help in the production of certain uh, crops because some crops would demand a lot of, or need a lot of sun actually to uh, grow or succeed. So that's one factor. And climate has influence on soil and vegetation. You know, there are certain uh, soils uh, which would not um, yield so much uh, food in certain areas. So it is a very important thing. So having said that, we move to agricultural systems in the tropical regions. So what are the general characteristics of agriculture in the tropics? Uh, the largest uh, proportion of people in the tropical world produce or practice um, subsistence farming, right? So basically they produce and consume almost everything that they, uh, they put out there. Or and the subsistence farming practice are characterized by low level of technological applications, right? So they just uh, depend on the rain. So in most cases, they are described as uh, rain-fed uh, uh, farming, right? And in most cases, uh, they don't use too much uh, fertilizer, right? And uh, much of the, um, much human labor is also required. 
because uh, compared to agriculture in the temperate region they would use uh, a lot of machinery so it means that it is capital intensive but in the developing world context or most of the tropical uh, regions they wouldn't uh, they do not you know uh, rely on this um, capital intensive approach and this is also very common in Africa to say because when you talk about the tropical regions you can find some in Latin America but then this thing that we're talking about is very uh, common in sub-Saharan Africa um, but then we've seen a lot of uh, progress in uh, agriculture in Southeast Asia and Latin America. But when it comes to um, Sub-Saharan Africa, there hasn't been much progress. It's more stagnant and there are so many factors. You know, farming, uh, a drought is one of the factors. You know, most uh, Sahelian countries have experienced uh, or are still experiencing drought. Others are also due to technologies that they have not been able to adapt to new technologies or, or apply them. They probably do not have the uh, know-how to use these technologies. So there, there's so much stagnation when it comes to the growth of agriculture. Uh, and this also means that there's full shortage. Um, in many cases, um, I mean, when you read the literature, you find out that um, food security uh, has become a, a very uh, important thing in most uh, developing countries and it's basically as a result of shortage of food right and when this happens it also has several implications it has security implications it had it has health implications and so on and so forth and a typical example is the Sahelian countries which I uh, mentioned earlier on uh, while the dominant farming system in the tropics is subsistence, some form of commercial uh, farming also takes place. So it doesn't mean that everything in the tropical world is bad, right? There are other good things in a sense that they engage in commercial farming and some of these farm products are exported to the international market. So they are really plugged in, uh, into the global market. And this uh, actually takes place on plantations. I mentioned the palm industry, for instance. It is a very big industry. We have cocoa plantations, and it's supplying the whole world with cocoa, right? So the list is actually endless. Now, another factor um, or a characteristic of the uh, tropical region or tropical agricultural system is a shifting cultivation, which is usually an extensive uh, substance uh, crop farming. That's uh, another way to uh, classify it. Um, shifting cultivation is the most extensive practice farming system in the humid uh, rainfall environment of Latin America, Africa, and Southeast Asia. Right. So when somebody is asking you about where these things uh, take place, you can mention any of these three uh, regions. And although the system varies from one continent to the other, the following are the main characteristics. And uh, I think you have to pay uh, a lot of uh, attention to them. Um, what happens here is that first of all, the farmers clear the land for planting by slashing the vegetation and burning the debris, usually in the dry season. Right. So this, if you have followed this lecture closely, this uh, resonates with the, the different methods of agricultural production. Right. So it shows you actually what takes place in the tropical world. Uh, in the savanna areas, fire may be set directly to the vegetation as a way of clearing it. You know, because they just don't, in most of these areas, they don't have the tools to deal with these things. So they, they find it more convenient to burn, right? Of course, it has negative implications, which you know that it's going to, uh, it pollutes the environment and even poses risk. You know, bushfires, which uh, today is becoming uh, common in uh, our country, is as a result of some of these uh, practices. But interestingly, the ashes from the bent uh, vegetation or debris provide nutrients to certain soils, which actually helps in uh, uh, the yields of some farmers. 
and then the crops are planted with the aid of simple farming implements or tools such as uh, cutlasses, holes, digging sticks at the beginning of the raining season. So it also tells you that the methods or ways in which people uh, engage in farming is different from the tropical regions, which uh, we'll, 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 we'll learn later. And the use of simple uh, tools ensures minimum soil disturbances. Sometimes people think that the use of um, simple tools are just too bad, but then it has its positive sides because when you're using, let's say, a combined harvester, this uh, harvester runs on ties. And, you know, if you do uh, a critical analysis of the field in which this combined harvester is being uh, used, it's going to um, affect the quality of the soil because this machine, this heavy machine, moves on the soil, right? So it's going to kill or destroy certain vegetation. So it has a negative effect. And I've seen elsewhere where they try to use a more natural way of preserving the vegetation. So you go to some of these advanced countries and instead of them using machines to clear the forest area, for example, they introduce animals such as uh, livestock, you know, uh, horses, which eats the grass. So they have a more natural way of preserving the forest than using machines. So the same thing can also be uh, talked about in, in terms of agriculture. So when people are using these uh, rudimentary tools, it is not always a bad thing. You can only look at it uh, from a negative uh, perspective when you think about the yields. But if you're very environmental conscious, then I think uh, it's one of the best ways to engage in farming. And the farmers usually plant a mixture of food crops with varying uh, growth periods, nutrient requirements, and food values. And this uh, ensures a continuous food supply throughout the year uh, and a complete uh, ground over. Uh, yields in uh, shifting cultivation are low and the farming uh, methods are also uh, inefficient. Um, beside that, um, the cultivation, according to uh, CAR, uh, is uh, a way of life of the people. In other words, it's cultural and not uh, only seen as a means of keeping alive. It's not only seen as an economic activity, so to say, but uh, or um, a livelihood activity, but as a way of life uh, of the people. So we can say that uh, shifting cultivation forms part of the culture of the people who practice uh, them. Um, it also requires a large uh, area of uh, land size for production. And this was possible in the past, but today as a result of population, high population density, this uh, thing is uh, reducing. Um, today, this traditional way of life is under threat due to rising population pressure and then also increasing shortage of uh, land, as well as the negative uh, effects of the environment that uh, we are experiencing. So, uh, there are so many challenges uh, that one can uh, associate with the shifting cultivation system. Um, there's also outside influence, and this have also helped in changing both, uh, uh, changing it both as an agricultural system and also as a way of life. And what are some of these things? Um, today we are seeing the use of uh, more technologies, right? So the ways in which these people produce have changed. And then with the uh, globalization, it means that the various approaches, you know, people are uh, adopting various uh, techniques or approaches from uh, abroad, and all of these are affecting the system. So in some places like Thailand, the method of farming has become illegal, right? And uh, as a result of its uh, negative effects on the environment. Right, so it, it also tells you that the phase of shifting cultivation is changing. Yeah, then we'll move on to the bush uh, fallow system. 
This is, as you can see, uh, it's another extensive substance crop farming system that is similar to shifting cultivation. The difference is, I mean, there's a very thin line between the two uh, systems. However, the areas cultivated are usually larger. You know, ideally, the shifting cultivation system, you know, takes much uh, large space. But for the bush fallow system, it takes a larger uh, space. So that you know tells you the difference. Uh, the length of time that is left to follow is shorter, you know, compared to other forms. And the farming community is uh, uh, usually sedimentary. The length of uh, follow also depends on the soil potential, right? So as you can see, better soils are used more intensively on a short uh, follow rotation while the poorer soils, you know, takes a, a longer time. Um, again, the lands are closer to settlements and they are more intensely managed than those further away from the uh, settlement area. Yeah, so moving on, we will talk ab uh, about the pastoral nomadism. Uh, that's another extensive livestock farming. And what is this? Uh, this is a, uh, a type of subsistence agriculture based on the heading of domesticated animals. And we all know what domesticated animals are. Uh, it could be cattle, it could be goats, it could be sheep, or it could even be piggery. Uh, this farming is practiced um, in the semi-humid tropics where conditions are not favorable for crop production. We know that uh, certain areas, um, like in the semi-humid uh, conditions, the weather situation is pretty bad. It's very hot in such areas. So most of the uh, vegetations there cannot survive the heat. So in order for these people to survive, they have uh, developed the uh, uh, system of um, producing livestock or raising livestock. So this is what they do. And these headmen are confined in Africa, Central Asia, as well as in the Middle East. The important characteristic of this farming system is that um, the headers move from one place to the other uh, according to the marked seasonal variations. You know, so in situations where it is very hot, they would move to areas where it's not so hot, where the vegetations are pretty high so that the animals can graze on. Um, so um they search for basic uh food for these uh animals that's uh, the cattle sheep goats and also camels um individual uh, headers own, uh, do not own lands you know because they are moving from one place to the other so they just uh, get to those fields and then uh, make good use of the uh, vegetations there. Uh, the lands are usually owned by the community, so it's a communal thing instead of individuals owning them. The headers depend on what the livestock can provide. You know, usually what do the, these uh, livestock provide? The, the key thing is milk, right? So they depend on them. So they sell milk for cash crops uh, in exchange uh, of food as a form of butter. So one will be thinking that in this day, um, do butter system still exist? But it is something that actually exists in these uh, communities. Uh, the sale of cattle for slaughter is a source of income because they have to meet other needs. Uh, so they would slaughter the cattle or other animals, sell them, and then um, use that as a source of income in order to purchase other things. So the cattle is seen as a source of wealth and uh, prestige among the people. So the, the higher, uh, the, the number of uh, cattle that you have the, uh, determines your wealth and status in society. The annual migration of uh, headers follow uh, defined routes, you know, they, they pick particular routes in which they, they, they move. And they are fixed points of settlements in the process. So what happens is that as they move along certain areas, they will spend time there and to settle. And this situation makes uh, it possible for them to carry out some cultivations. You know, when they find the land uh, fertile, they would make good use of them. 
So at the end of the day, they are able to get food to eat, and at the same time, their animals would also get something to feed on. Um, examples of uh, Normans can be found in, uh, in West Africa, that's among the Fulanis. Uh, the Bedouin Normans in Sahara fringes, the Twana of Botswana, and the Maasai of the East African Plateau are examples of uh, Normans. And it's seen as a way of life uh, for these people. Now, so moving on, we will touch on the commercial agricultural systems in the tropics. Before independence, much of commercial farming in the tropics was under the colonial rule. You know, the colonial masters needed our products, you know, for which would be used uh, for processing in their manufacturing plants. You know, so they depended most of uh, our, on our, most of our products as source of raw materials. Um, but after independence, much of the commercial uh, agriculture is now in the hands of indigenous people. You know, it's no longer dominated by the European colonial masters. And this um, has increased the proportion of agricultural uh, outputs being marketed in the tropics. You know, in the past, the markets were in the advanced countries. But today, since they do not have control over them, you know, everything is sold within the tropics or in the developed, uh, developing countries. Uh, this has aided population increase, rise in incomes, and increase in urbanization. Because people uh, would send them to specific market centers, it has attracted more people you know, to these market centers, and it has increased the population there. Uh, it has also contributed the incomes of people who deal in this uh, trade. And, you know, uh, by the fact that most of uh, people have moved to such areas, the population has also increased and in making such areas urbanized. And um, in our country, we have so many places that uh, which used to be villages or small towns which have now become urban areas. Yeah, and then we've also seen one uh, other factor, you know, to go back. One of the things that has contributed to the increasing proportion of uh, uh, commercial agriculture is also as a result of nationalization of uh, lands. Uh, we can take Zimbabwe as an example, you know, uh, they had this land reforms where uh, significant lands were taken from the uh, Europeans uh, who have settled there for uh, many years, you know, and these lands have shifted into the hands of the indigenous people. Yeah, so it, um, this has increased the production of uh, uh, crops in that area. So there's this both commercial livestock and commercial cash cropping uh, being practiced in the tropical areas. Uh, the commercial livestock is practiced in tropical uh, areas experiencing savanna conditions, right? And, and also in places where the Europeans uh, settled. Uh, examples of such areas is Botswana in Southern Africa. Um, cash crops in the tropics and subtropics are usually associated with plantations, but this has declined uh, since the Second World War, you know, and it, it still uh, can be linked with um, the European connection to Africa, right? So, I mean, during the Second World War, they needed a lot of food, uh, cash crops, you know, uh, to support the war efforts. Of, uh, in the advanced countries, but uh, as a result of the end of the Second World War, these things are no longer needed. So in many countries within the tropics, plantation agriculture has been replaced by extension of cash crops, farming on native small holdings and medium-sized enterprises under the control of local people with strong government support. So I mean, the latter uh, part of the sentence is very important that the government support, you know, because these small-scale small, uh, s uh, small scale industries are very important to the economies of uh, most countries. 
And because of their smallness, if they don't get the support, you know, if the government do not create an enabling environment for them, most of them will fold up. So it's very important for them to get this government support. So that explains what um, you're seeing on the slide. Moving on to uh, plantation agriculture in the tropics, just like the commercial agriculture, plantation uh, agriculture was initially established to supply uh, the advanced countries with uh, raw materials uh, for their industries. And the plantations were owned by the Europeans, you know, the colonial uh, masters. As they needed accessibility to shipments, plantations were usually established along the coast or settled island, right? So that is to make it much more easier uh, for them to ship them because if they plant them in the far hinterlands, the cost of transportation will be very expensive. Beside that, most of the hinterland areas were inaccessible due to lack of development of uh, uh, transportation infrastructure. So for the coast where they had developed, you know, um, it was much more easier for them to transport these things. So the farms were sited pretty close to these uh, areas. Plantation agriculture were and are still uh, usually monoculture. In the, and what this means is that it's only one crop. Mono means one, you know, so the production is usually one crop. And this is done to gain benefits from specialization in as well as large scale um, production. The character of plantation has changed in recent years that there has been some diversification into uh, crop farming activities. Some plantations now integrate staple uh, food crop production. So instead of sticking to one particular uh, form of production, they have you know, introduced others into it. So what this means is that, for example, food crop production is integrated in the early stage of development of cocoa production. So whilst these cocoa trees are growing, because cocoa trees take some time to mature, so they could mix this up with, let's say, cassava or maize production. So they could harvest these uh, crops whilst they wait for the cocoa to mature. So this provides them extra income um, when they do that. And it's also associated, associated with large-scale production. Uh, beside that, it also uh, provides high quality products due to the management of scientific uh, techniques. Because these are normally owned by uh, rich uh, owners, they are able to invest into, let's say, research and uh, development in order to um, enhance the high yields of their products. And it also enhances uh, effective use of vast lands. Because you need a very large land to actually go into this kind of production. So, I mean, um, when it comes to this form of production, um, it enhances uh, uh, the use of large areas. And this leads to, uh, lead to the production of job creation and as well as infrastructure, including the use of communication, road or roads or rail transportation, as well as uh, port outlets. You know, so in the end, it enhances development in the area in which these uh, uh, activities taking place. So you can see this uh, range of advantages that uh, uh, plantation agriculture provides. Uh, other forms of uh, advantages that one can get from uh, plantation agriculture is that uh, incomes of plantation workers support the local economy. You know, most of these workers earn pretty high income, so they spend their money locally, and this helps in you know promoting or uh, encouraging the local economy to grow. And it also helps in reducing the urban migration in the area because 
these rural areas, when they uh, people in the rural areas don't find jobs to do, the next thing they do is to move to the urban areas. But if they can find jobs and also spend their monies locally, then the tendency to move out of the place is uh, reduced. And community facilities such as education, health, water, and sanitation facilities are also provided for workers and their farmers. You know, because these are large holdings, the owners of these plantations can provide these services for the people and it also reduces the, uh, the temptation of migration because they have the schools to educate their children. They have all these facilities that they can use. And it also brings about some diffusion of new techniques um, of farming and encourages cash crop farming in and around the areas of plantation. I, I think the key thing here is the diffusion of new techniques. You know, day in and day out, um, people are creating new technologies. And therefore, um, they are able to get these technologies and use them and at the same time diffuse them to other areas where they are needed. Having talked about the advantages that plantation agriculture brings, um, there are other challenges or disadvantages. As uh, I said earlier on, large uh, parcels of land or large areas are needed to engage in uh, plantation agriculture. And when this happens, it means that um, it brings about challenge because when people do not have the land, enough land space, then it becomes a challenge. But even if the land is available, there is also the uh, tendency of displacing other indigenous people because some of these people may be engaged in some small scale farming activities and these lands could be taken over from them because the owners of some of these um, plantation agriculture could be very influential and they can um, access a lot of land in the area. So in the end, it's going to wipe out some of these uh, small-scale farmers. So it's actually problematic. And beside that, the local people can also be exploited. You know, given the levels of poverty in some of these uh, communities, the owners of these um, large-scale uh, plantations can exploit, take advantage of the poverty in the area and exploit them. And the growth of single crop, that's the monoculture, may also lead to the overexploitation of the soil. It's uh, important to sometimes mix uh, uh, the production of food. You know, instead of depending on one particular crop, you have others because some plants help in uh, and make uh, help help in the fertility of the land. But then, if you depend on a particular crop, then you tend to over exploit the land. And other challenge is the poor weather. If the weather is bad in the area, then it means that uh, there's a lot of uh, investment going to be lost as a result of the bad uh, weather condition. And then the over reliance of a country on uh, one particular crop uh, is economically risky especially in situations where uh, there are fluctuations in the prices of uh, crops. You know, to just oppose, we can uh, link this to the current oil prices. You know, currently, oil prices are low. So countries that depend uh, solely on, um, or largely on oil, uh, it means that their incomes or revenues are going to come uh, to reduce. And the same thing will apply to those who uh, depend on a particular crop, a single crop for their uh, income or revenues. Um, as plantation agriculture concentrates in the production of catch crops, it also leads to the neglect of food crop production. Right? So it's very important to kind of uh, blend the two in most cases. That is blend uh, other forms of cash products instead of depending on one. So um, when there's over dependence on one particular crop, then this may cause food shortages resulting in the importation of food. And this also has other implications you know, in terms of foreign exchange. Um, it means that the government would have to uh, use uh, a lot of foreign exchange to import 
um, food from abroad, and this also has other uh, economic implications. So one needs to actually uh, take this into consideration. So uh, in summary, uh, I can say that in this lecture, we've seen the role of agriculture in national development. Uh, that is, uh, we've seen it as a key economic activity in terms of food production. You know, food is also used as raw materials for industry. At the same time, it uh, provides foreign exchange earnings and employment. So we've seen all of these. We've seen the various agricultural systems in the world, the different classifications of the world agricultural system and an agricultural system in the tropics. So I hope you found this uh, lecture interesting and we bring this uh, le uh, session to a close. Thank you.